And the title of my message this morning is Fantasy Worlds and Technology, The Avatar Effect. Fantasy Worlds and Technology, The Avatar Effect. You know, if you, if you look up the 50 largest grossing or uh, largest grossing films of all time, in other words, movies that have made the most money, uh, the most money of all time, 29 of them are in the science fiction genre. I mean, this is a booming industry. This is an industry and, and a thing that is very popular in media and culture and pervasive uh, in our society as well. Uh, we would be foolish not to think, uh, even as Bible believers, Bible advocates, standing on the outside, perhaps looking in, that this, that media and culture affects society. It influences, it has a message, and that this particular genre or worldview, we're going to ex examine that here in a moment, has had a it has had and is having an effect on our society and culture. When people are spending billions upon billions of dollars for this type of inter entertainment, uh, then it's something that we ought to look at and see um, what is behind it all. You know, when you, when you Google the term science fiction, 46 million results are found. That's, that's a lot of web pages. Uh, that, that's a, a lot of reading, a lot of information, and, and it really represents, when we give this, these Google statistics, it represents really, a, 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 in a statistical fashion, the amount of energy and thought that's being projected and consumed towards a topic. For something that many would claim is just imaginary, made up, and fun, we sure are spending a lot of time, energy, and uh, resources towards its production. It consumes a lot of who we are and a lot of what we are uh, in thinking of this idea uh, of science fiction. But the idea of creating and imagining alternate realities is not a new phenomenon. So what we're discussing today is not necessarily a modern problem or issue. Uh, what we're talking about today is it, not something that previous generations have not dealt with. It just comes in different forms. Uh, it just manifests itself in different ways. And so it is up to this generation and Bible advocates of today to be able to take the truth of scriptures, lay it over what the world is presenting, and be able to correctly decipher the messages that we're being taught. But know this, friends, that the idea of making up a new world is not new. Turn with me, you should be in your Bibles there, to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Ch Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. It, it, it's actually so old that it goes back to the beginning. The, the concept of a different reality. Uh, the concept of worlds and environments uh, in which the laws and morality that we are that are described to us by the Bible that affects the world that we live in today or that governs the world that we live in today has been put into question since the very beginning. Notice here, we, we come to Genesis chapter 3, and just by a placement in the scriptures, you know where we're at. We're at the beginning, and Genesis chapter 3 is often referred to as the fall, and so we're talking about Adam and Eve. And so here is Adam and Eve, and it's, uh, more poignantly, Eve and her conversation with the serpent. And notice here the Bible here, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, the Bible says this. It says, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Now, before we, we go a little bit further into this and laying down a little bit of a biblical foundation here, notice immediately that the Bible gives us a great adjective here in describing the serpent. He is subtle. He is subtle. In other words, what we're talking about here today and the things that we're going to discuss gets hidden in subtleties. And that's why it's so hard for sometimes as us as Christians and believers to be able to really to put our finger down on something or to be able to, to point it out because it is subtle. It is subtle. Listen, I, I dare say if I were to get up here this morning and we were going to talk about something about uh, uh, you shouldn't watch movies about devil worship. Uh, or you shouldn't participate in cultural phenomenons that have to do with the occult uh, and that are expressly occultish, that's not very subtle. And, and all of us in here, we go, yeah, obvious. Uh, that'll be a short sermon. Get to the point. Get to the end. I agree. Amen. Let's go. Uh, but notice here that the Bible says here that there is, that this 
concept that we're going to be talking about here, and our adversary, the devil here, is one of subtlety. This is not something, uh, in other words, it, it hides in the presumable gray areas. It, it, it hides in the shadows. It, it's not coming at us with a bullhorn, but it comes with a whisper. With a whisper. And notice what the Bible says here in verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Here is the subtlety and the question being posed. What it is that God had said. And remember, God's, God's word is truth. And so the subtlety is attacking truth. And notice what verse 2 says here. The woman said unto the serpent, he said, we may eat of the fruit of the tree, uh, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. There was truth there. That was a true statement. Uh, Eve was repeating what God had instructed to them. Uh, and so she was communicating back to the devil this truth. And notice what was counteracted by this truth. Verse 3, it said, But the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. The lie. The lie. Now, bold-faced lie. Uh, but posed in the subtlety of a question, you're not going to die. It's, it's really not going to kill you. And notice what goes on here in verse 5. The Bible says this, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, now think about this. What was the attraction here? It, it really wasn't the, the uh, attraction of of having something, and Adam and Eve, all their, their needs were being met. Uh, God had created for them a perfect place to exist. Uh, not only were all their physical needs met, God was very concerned about the relational, uh, the relationship needs, and so God created Eve for Adam, and so their, their physical uh, and human relationship needs were being met. The Bible describes for us uh, that, that they walked with God in the cool of the morning, in the cool of the day, and so their spiritual needs were being met. It, it wasn't as if uh, Eve was being tempted with what she didn't have, per se. She was being tempted, or she was being proposed, an alternate reality. Let me show you a different world. Uh, let me show you a world, not the world that God has constructed for you, not the world that God has put around you, but let me show you a world without God. Let me give you an alternate reality. And, and so this idea or the, or the, or, or the proposition of, of having make-believe or having uh, worlds in which the construct rules and morals that God has created for human beings to exist in, to cre the creation of worlds where those things are suspended or those things are alleviated is not a new concept. Here the temptation to Eve was to exist in a world that was absent of God's law, of God's truth. And so here Eve was presented with the opportunity for an alternate reality. As we present these Bible and culture DVDs, we pose to you five questions that help us to analyze and look at the topic at hand. And the first question I want to ask this morning are why fantasy games, novels, and movies are so popular? I mean, why are they uh, so popular? Uh, fantasy films and books are stories that are often involved adventure, battle, journeys that usually, usually in a made-up fictional supernatural world. This lends itself to the creation of mythical and fascinating creatures and characters with unusual abilities and interesting discoveries and challenges along the way. The only limit to a fantasy book or film is imagination, is imagination as everything is possible within the fantasy genre. The reason that fantasy is so popular for both adults and children alike is that they offer escapism from work or school into a different realm. If you're reading about elves or magic, then the worries of business, homework, and housework are forgotten, and everyone can let their imagination run wild. 
This is probably the reason that fantasy is such a broad category and unites almost everybody, everyone, from the elderly to those just starting to read and to take, time, and to take an interest in films. This is from a fantasy book review, uh, review website uh, based in the United Kingdom. N notice some of the things that this author here was talking about, uh, what the attraction was to this world. First of all, it, it offers an escapism from reality. It, it offers an escapism from reality. And, and can I say this? That reality often is hard. Uh, because of the consequences of sin on this planet and within mankind, we are faced with, we are faced with some brutal realities. And so a genre or, or, or a, a something like a fantasy games and novels and movies and things become popular because they allow a form of escapism. Now, let me preface this by saying this. That's not the only form of escapism that exists. Uh, we have devised many different ways to escape our reality, whether or not we escape into bad relationships or whether we escape into the abuse of substances. Um, we find different ways to escape reality. But friends, can I, can I challenge you with this thought that coming even from the very words of the proponents of these, of these ideas and fantasy worlds and, uh, and these things, that there is a major draw to them because they provide the same types of effects as those other means to escape a reality. Oh, uh, listen, uh, who doesn't like when you come home after a hard day's work to be able to turn on the tube and just disengage? I mean, I, I've used that statement before myself, uh, to be able to go and not think anymore, uh, to be able to, to put those, those things aside and be able to, to focus on something else. And so here it offers an escape from uh, reality. You know, uh, also it allows people to operate outside the normal physical, societal, and normal and moral limitations. I mean, isn't that what's kind of cool about this, uh, the idea of fantasy thinking? I mean, it allows us to suspend normal rules. Listen, the average Clark Kent becomes Superman. Now, who, who would like that? You know, here I am, the average uh, desk jockey. I got my nerdy glasses on. I got, you know, I'm sitting here and, and no one, you know, I'm, I'm the social, uh, I'm kind of like, you know, a little off. But then when I jump in and out of a phone booth, you know, I become Superman. There's something appealing to that. The geeky Peter Parker becomes the cool Spider-Man. Uh, the Bruce Wayne becomes the moral judge uh, unto himself in Batman. He's a vigilante. He, he decides what is right and wrong and, and, dis, and, and disperses his own judgment and his own morality. And, and so what is the attraction, particularly to this idea of fantasy thinking or in movies and novels and all these, not only this escape from reality, but this, uh, this idea to, to operate outside normal constricting bounds. Now listen, we're, we're going to talk about this because some people are going to say, well listen, what's wrong with that? Using your imagination, um, uh, being able to, to imagine these things and engage those things. And, and so notice as we begin to connect some dots here and Lord willing lead you to a, a place where you can make great decisions for you and your family. So why are fantasy games and novels and movies so, no, so popular? It offers this escapism, allows us to operate outside these normal uh, realms of physical, societal, and moral limitations. But secondly, let me ask you this. Is fantasy a genre or a worldview? Think about that for a second. Is fantasy... This concept of fantasy, and, and, and let me use a couple of other words to interpose upon it. Fantasy, mythology, is this, are these things um, uh, simply a genre, or are they a worldview? You know, I, I think back to when I was uh, a young person, and, and uh, remembering when I watched Star Wars, for the first time. You remember, and some of you, I, I was, it came out in the late 70s, and uh, I was still a young kid. I think the first one of those movies that I really remember kind of watching was The Return of the Jedi. I think it was the, it's the third one in the series. And as you look back and you study this, the, the phenomena, the late 70s, early 80s, of, of the Star Wars phenomena that came out, what was, what was the attraction that everyone had? It looked so real. 
I mean, that was really Luke Skywalker in this little spaceship flying around and blowing up a Death Star. I mean, no longer were we in the days of Buck Rogers where you could actually see the little strings or, or the other black and white sci-fi movies where uh, the guy was on the moon and you can kind of see the stick in the background propping him around. I mean, it actually was looked pretty cool. And so the initial attraction was not necessarily a philosophy or a worldview, but man, that looks pretty neat. I mean, and so there was this, the technology had allowed the storytelling to go to another level. And so the viewer was allowed to enter themselves into a greater level of interaction. Now, listen, we have a modern phenomenon of this. Think, think about our, our most recent, recent pop culture phenomenon, Avatar. The Avatar movie came out. Now listen, put aside uh, worldview, philosophy, and all those things about Avatar. But what was it that really, what was the one common thing that everyone said? That looks so real. I mean, look at that thing. Those people, that guy, is, now it's in 3D, and they're coming at me, and that guy turned into the blue guy. And it, it, I mean, it was, there was this sense of reality, and what was struck, what was the first comment always made about it was the reality of it, the immersion of it. Now listen, being a tech geek, techie person, all of you know, spending time around me, I have my gadgets, I have all this. Listen, I love cool things. And you show me something that you can do cool on Photoshop, and I'm like, that's pretty cool. Uh, when you can make someone and make them appear and disappear. You show me uh, a special, I mean, believe me, I'm the first one to say special effects are awesome. I mean, those things are cool and they're entertaining and to watch, but let me ask you these. Are these movies simply about the technology or the cool special effects? Or is there more behind it? Is this just a genre of special effects? Or is it the proposition of a worldview? I have a video for you. I'm going to let the guys go ahead and cue it up here. And it's George Lucas. Now, George Lucas is the creator of Star Wars. And I don't necessarily mean to pick on Star Wars, we can pick up, we can fit in a number of different movies, but here is direct from them. We didn't edit this. We took out some of the movie clips that they put in here because I just didn't know we wanted to show Star Wars in church. Uh, but here is straight from him, George Lucas, the creator, the creator of the special effects, the guy that thought them all up and how to make the Death Star look real. But he's going to share with us his own words about eight minutes, his philosophy, his thinking. Now, let me preface this, this video by once giving you a little bit about, about me personally. Listen, I, growing up, Star Wars fan, watched all the movies. I could tell you the lines. I could tell you everything. And I have to remember, when I saw this clip a couple of years ago, I, it came out with one of the DVD box sets. And I saw it one time. I have to be honest with you. That in watching it, there was a part of me, the Holy Spirit inside of me said, oh, don't say that. Don't, don't say it that way. Uh, don't, don't mean it that way because you get a little bit more of an insight into what was behind the thinking. I've come to is that all the religions are true. They just see a different part of the elephant. A religion is basically a, a, a container for faith. Um, faith is uh, the, the glue that holds us together as a society. Faith in our, in our, our culture, our our world or you know whatever it is that we're trying to hang on to uh, is a very important part of uh, I think uh, allowing us to, to remain stable remain balanced Makes it grow. 
Its energy surrounds us and binds us. Luminous beings are we, not this crude matter. You must feel the force around you. Here, between you, we, the tree, the rock, everywhere. Yes, even between the land and the ship. And where does God fit into this concept of the universe, in this cosmos that you've created? Is the force God? I put the force into the movies in order to try to awaken a certain kind of spirituality in young people. Uh, more a belief in God than a belief in any particular uh, you know, religious system. I mean, the, 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 the real question is to ask the question. Because if you, if you haven't enough interest in the mysteries of life to ask the questions, is, is there a God or is there not a God? Um, uh, that's, that's, for me, the worst thing that can happen. You know, if you ask a young person, is there a God, and they say, I don't know. You know, I, I think you should have an opinion about that. Do you have an opinion or are you looking? Well, I think there is a God. No question. What that God is or what we know about that God, I'm not sure. Uh, the one thing I know about life and about uh, the, uh, the, the nature of the human race is that it, the human race has always believed it's known everything. You know, even the cavemen thought they had it all figured out and they knew everything there was to know about everything because that's, what, that's where mythology came from. You know, it's constructing uh, some kind of, of, of context for the unknown. So we figured it all out, it was fine. I would say that, you know, Cavemen had, you know, on a scale, understood about one. You know, now we've made it up to about five. The only thing that most people don't realize is the scale goes to a million. The central epic of our culture has, has been the Bible, and it's about you know, fall, wandering, redemption, return. But the Bible no longer occupies that central place in our culture culture today. More and more people today, are, young people in particular, are turning to movies for their inspiration, not to organize religion. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I hope that doesn't end up being the, the course that this whole thing takes, because um, I think there's definitely a place for organized religion. That's a very important part of the social fabric, uh, and I would hate to find ourselves in a completely secular world uh, where, uh, you know, em entertainment was passing for some kind of religious experience. One reason, one critic said, that Star Wars has been so popular with young people is religion without strings attached, that it becomes a very thin base for theology. In fact, well, it is a thin base for theology. That's why I would hesitate to call the Forest God. Um, when the film came out, uh, almost every single religion took Star Wars and used it as an example of their religion. And, and we're able to relate it to young people and saying this is what, and relate the stories specifically to the Bible and relate stories uh, to the Quran and the, you know, the Torah and things. And so it's like, you know, if it's a tool that can be used to make uh, old stories be new and relate to younger people, that's what the whole point was. We downloaded something from your website the other day, and there you were talking about how you wanted the Jedi to be more than just fighters. You wanted them to be spiritual, but you didn't say what you meant by that. I, I guess they're like uh, ultimate father figures or negotiators. Uh, and, and at this point in time, they are, they're sent out to negotiate a, a deal. How do you think this trade viceroy will deal with the Chancellor's demands? These Federation types are cowards. The negotiations will be short. They help to put forth answers uh, where people are in the middle of a dispute. Do not defy the Council Master, not again. I shall do what I must, Obi-Wan. They aren't an aggressive force at all. They will not go along with you this time. Uh, they try to, uh, I don't know, conflict resolution, I guess, is what you might, intergalactic therapists. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been influenced 
by Buddhism because Star Wars came along just about the time there was this growing interest in America in Eastern religions. And, uh, I, and I notice in The Phantom Menace, the new episode one, that uh, they discover this slave child who has a, an aura about him. And it reminded me of uh, how the Buddhists go out to look for the next Dalai Lama. Mm -hmm. Well, there's, a, again, a mixture of all kinds of, of uh, mythology and religious beliefs that have been amalgamated into the movie. And I've tried to take the ideas that seem to cut across the most cultures, uh, because I'm fascinated by that. And I think that's one of the things that um, I really um, got from Joe Campbell was that What's what he was trying to do is find the common threads through the various mythology, through the the religions. One of the comparisons that came to mind just when I was re-watching the series recently is when Darth Vader tempts Luke to come over to the Empire by offering him all that the Empire has to offer. I was taken back in my own youth to the story of Satan taking Christ to the mountain and offering him the kingdoms of the world if only he would turn away from his mission. Right. Was that conscious in your mind? Well, yeah, I mean, that, that story also has been retold. The temptation, I mean, Buddha was tempted in the same way. Uh, it's, it's all through mythology. I didn't want to invent a religion. I wanted to try to explain in a different way the religions that have already existed. You're creating a new myth. Well, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm telling an old myth in a new way. I'm just taking the, 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 the core myth and I'm localizing it. Uh, as it turns out, I'm localizing it for the planet, but um, I guess I'm localizing it for the end of the, of the millennium more than I am for any particular place. This is the, the you know, this is, this is, again, part of the globalization of the world we live in the average human being has much more awareness of the other cultures that exist, coexist with them on this planet. And that certain things um, go across cultures uh, and uh, entertainment is one of them. And uh, film uh, and the stories that I tell cut across all cultures are seen all around the world. So what lessons do you think they're taking away from watching Star Wars and, and Italy and Malaysia and South America. One of the main themes in the film is uh, having organisms realize that they must live together and they must live together for mutual advantage. Not just humans, but all living things and everything in the galaxy is part of a, a greater whole. Now let's see if we can't figure out what you are, my little friend. And where you come from. I saw part of the message. You... I seem to have found it. General Kenobi, years ago you served my father in the Clone Wars. Now he begs you to help him in his struggle against the Empire. I regret that I am unable to present my father's request to you in person, but my ship has fallen under attack, and I'm afraid my mission to bring you to Alderaan has failed. I have placed information vital to the survival of the Rebellion into the memory systems of this R2 unit. My father will know how to retrieve it. You must see this droid safely delivered to him on Alderaan. This is our most desperate hour. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. How do you explain the power of film to get inside us? Well, I think film is a very modern art form. It, it takes all of the you know, all of the aspects, the senses, really, of other art forms, be it painting, music, uh, literature, you know, drama, uh, theater, uh, and puts them into one, one art form. Notice here that in the storytelling, that no, couple of words that, that he used here, the idea of the, the creation of mythology, uh, the mythology and the the telling of the story. In other words, as this supposed genre is being presented, that there is the well thought out orchestrated idea of presenting thought and presenting concepts. And that those concepts through this idea of mythology would be disseminated and 
read a lot and recognized and accepted beyond the lightsabers and beyond the starships blowing that uh, blowing up that there are common themes within all these different mythologies notice how lucas himself uh identifies or defines this concept of mythology answering the unknown answering the unknown Think back to even early uh, or previous civilizations. Think back to the Romans or even to the Greeks in their mythology. Mythology in our past helped us to answer questions that we did not have the answers to. In this very mythology, often mythology was to answer the questions when God was removed from a society. Adam and Eve had knowledge. Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the morning. Adam and Eve had truth presented to them. When you remove God from a society, when you remove God from a thing, even a form of entertainment or in storytelling, that, that, that removal of God and his word and his truth has to be replaced. Explanation is desired. And so in the place of God, the creator, the one that we are responsible with, we are then given these Greek mythological gods of, of a Zeus and an Apollos and these other gods that controlled the world around us and controlled the circumstances. When things happened around us and we were not able to identify or put our finger on why those things happened or those occurrences happened, they were attributed not to the God of the universe, but they were attributed to these mythological figures. And so in this idea of mythology, of presenting uh, these different ideas and concepts, we find a common theme. And so mythology, even as what Lucas was talking about, and let me tell you this, what Lucas did with Star Wars and what James Cameron has done with Avatar is not new. It's not new. It's been happening. We, we've been doing it since the fall. We've been creating these mythologies to explain these different questions that we have. And yet, often we see common themes that run throughout these. And the first one is this, the ascension of man through his own efforts because of inherent goodness or humanism. There's always a concept of humanism involved in this, that inside of you, if you can tap it, that even the evil Darth Vader had something good in him, in and of himself, that he could search out redemption. Secondly, the worship of nature or paganism. And notice here that as he ended in his mythology that he had constructed, which he said was just a combination of a bunch of other mythology that was out there. Uh, he said that this understanding that the listener, the viewer would have this understanding of their symbiotic relationship with all living things around them. A concept of paganism. And yet often throughout all of these mythologies, whether or not we're talking about Star Wars or whether or not we're talking about Greek gods or Roman gods or even Esau's fables, the common omission is a biblical worldview. The common omission in all these is that there is one God. The common omission in all these is man's depravity. In other words, that, that man cannot save himself, that man cannot redeem himself, and that salvation is through Christ alone. That these are common themes throughout all mythology, whether or not this was a philosophy class and we were studying ancient Greek mythology, or, or whether we're studying modern 20th century cinema, all these mythological stories seem to have the same reoccurring common themes and the same common omissions, and really are an outward example an outward plane of when society and culture removes God, that the void that he leaves has to be filled. We have to have an answer. We have to have an explanation. Whether or not that explanation is far-fetched. Why has mythology had such a strong place in human civilization, and is it beneficial? Myth addresses the deepest psychological needs and motivations of the human race. And that is why myth is so similar throughout the world. The story in a particular myth addresses themes that are part of the common needs of all human beings and thus reflect the experience of all human beings across a large segment of time and the planet. Because of this, myth contains a strong wisdom that comes from the communal experience of humanity across thousands of years. The, they speak to our common need, our shared dreams, our desires, motivations, and actions that stem from them all. You see, it fills a void, as we were just explaining. It fills a void of, of, of allowing explanation for the unknown or unknown events and gives reasons to why things happen. 
a couple of different things about this. Is mythology beneficial? First of all, it allows a means to view the world without the presence and influence of God. It allows us to construct a worldview outside of those parameters. It allows us to be able to begin to think in such a way. We'll talk about that a little bit more here in a moment. Secondly, it provides a mechanism. If only figuratively or in the imagination for man to circumvent his reality. Now, I'm going to title it this way. The hero concept. So, so now I've answered all the things I cannot explain around me through mythology, by the, these, the creation of these gods and these entities, and now I have created a mechanism, if it's just in my mind and imagination, to circumvent those realities with this idea of the hero concept. And we'll talk about the man becoming God. We'll talk about that here in a second. Secondly, or third, it clouds Bible truth. Is mythology beneficial? It clouds Bible truth. What does the Bible often claim to be? Myth. Right? Oh, oh listen, how much, how much truer is the story of Samson if in Greek mythology there's also the story of Hercules? It clouds Bible truth. And, and so you have to begin to answer the question for yourself. Is mythology helpful? Uh, is it beneficial? I, I remember, uh, I remember in, my, in, public, in my public school education uh, having to go through my world history classes and doing in-depth studies on Greek and Roman mythology. To what end? Because those are pagan religions. It, it might have been religious studies. Uh, we might as, might as well have been having Bible study, i.e. mythology Bible study. Because that is the need that those entities or those concepts replace. It replaced the truth of the Word of God. It clouds Bible truth. Well, fourth question. Is society's craving for mythological superheroes helpful or detrimental? Now listen, this, this one, it's not hard to explain the rationale the uh, enthusiasm about this because we are coming through another cycle in the, at least in the movie making genre where superheroes are, uh, you know, they're all of them. We got, we got them all. Uh, we, we got superheroes from every different type. You have superheroes that, you know, you want ones that fly, you want ones that swim, you want ones that disappear. Whatever kind of superhero you want, we got one for you. Whatever it is that you might associate with. The hero concept allows man the ability to ascend beyond the limitations of his present reality and limitations and to obtain godlike qualities. Think about that. I mean, use the simplest one in, in, the whole, in this whole genre or in this whole way of thinking. is Superman, right? I mean, we easily attribute to Superman a lot of godlike qualities or at least qualities that far supersede the ability of any human being. And so we watch these things and notice this as you watch a Superman episode or you turn on some of the things. We have been conditioned or we have an understanding that as we watch that episode, we can easily already construct the world in which he operates in. In other words, in any other circumstance, a man flying doesn't make sense unless you're watching a Superman movie. It makes perfect sense. Why did he fly that time? He can fly because I'm in his world right now. Uh, so much so that we're able to construct that in our imagination that it leads even our children to do what? I did it. I think I have a scar on my head to prove it. Uh, I, went to, I went to the bathroom. Uh, I got the towel. I, t I, ride it, I, I tied it around my neck. Uh, and I jumped off the couch. Because, you know, I was wanting to bring with me that construct, that reality, over into the real world. Now... Listen, I don't do it anymore. And some of you are saying, listen, Pastor Jason, that's ridiculous. We outgrow that. We, get, we got beyond that. Perhaps. But the exercise trained us to be able to think, understand, and function in an alternate reality. The exercise of it. The conditioning of it. Got us to be able to think otherworldly. 
Uh, God has to be able to, to construct in our minds these other environments. And listen, because the towel really didn't make you let you fly, you couldn't do it. And you quickly, for one brief moment, as you stood at the edge, you thought you were him. You thought that your world, that you had put aside all the natural laws of gravity, and you were about to jump. Now, what happened when you jumped? Reality smacked you right in the face. Right? And you see, and, and listen, and for many people, that was the growing up moment. I'm going somewhere with all this. That, that was the growing up moment. You see, and, and so that's why a lot of we go, that's why it's harmless. Because when you try to be a Superman, it never worked. Now listen, fortunately, for me, it was just a couch. I think my brother did it off the roof one time. <laughs> Reality took about a second longer for him to hit, but it hit a little harder. We understand the physical laws and moral attributes of, the created, of these created worlds. Superheroes lay the foundational conditioning of you can also be as God. Now listen, we're, just, we're going down one straight. There's a lot of other things that we can be picking on, but let's go down this way of thinking. That you can also be like God. So mythology answers the questions that we don't want to allow God to be the answer to. We create our own gods and then create our own system of the hero concept to ascend to that godlike state. It's all well and good because we can never really fly. It's all well and good because I can put a ring on my finger and say something and nothing ever really happened. It's all and good because I ate the Captain Crunch and I got the free prize and I put it on and nothing, it wasn't real. And, and reality hit me and I go, that's not real. And I grew up and I learned. But it brings us to our fifth question. What are the consequences then of our culture's acceptance of the Hindu concept of Avatar? Now listen, I'm using the word Avatar not in the sense of the movie. So listen, hear it out because I'm going to define it for you here. But what are the consequences of our culture's acceptance of the Hindu concept of Avatar? In Hinduism, Avatar... It means literally is a deliberate descent of a deity from heaven to, her, to, earth, to earth or a descent of a supreme being and is mostly translated in English as incarnation but uh, uh, accurately as appearance or manifestation. In other words, the Hindu concept of avatar is that there are individuals that are being controlled by a supreme being. In other words, someone else at an, in a different reality is affecting outcomes in this reality by occupying or controlling an individual. In other words, the individual, as you sit here today, is simply a character in a big play. And someone else is influencing them from the outside. Listen, it is not a new word. This word has been around for as, as long as it's a Hindu concept. It's, it's been a part of that um, the more English kind of definition of it is this, a manifestation of a deity in a bodily form on earth or an incarnation embodiment or manifestation of a person or idea. But recently, the term has gone on to mean, have even a greater meaning. And any of you that spend any time online understand the concept of avatar. My daughter has got a Wii a couple years ago. The very first thing that thing requires you to do before you can play anything is create an avatar. A physical represent, a representation of yourself as you participate in that game. And so here they are. It was funny because my daughters, Emma, wouldn't allow anyone to play any game unless they had a completely accurate avatar of themselves. And so people would come over and it would take them an hour before they could actually play Mario Kart because she had to design the avatar exactly like them. I don't know if that has any relevance. So I'm just saying, though, here it is. So she had to create the little character. Now, here we are with the control pad, right? Controlling what happens in that screen. And there's a, little, there's a physical representation of whatever, whatever we want to be. Now, in her preciseness and according to her personality, she wanted to go for, you know, someone that was an exact representation. Now, I've played these games before, and I've created an avatar for myself. And they're never bald and fat. I, I never create one who's balding and overweight. I always create one, you know, ah, let's just trim him up a little bit. You know, let's, let's make him look a little bit better. 
But think about this. Mythology plus technology has equaled a new realm of participation. What began as stories around a campfire under the skies, pointing out constellations and telling mythological stories that evolved to black and white television, that evolved to a film like Star Wars, which said it looks so real. They evolved to a film like Avatar, which it come, it's coming right out at me. Now, the combination of mythology and technology, same old mythology, same old stories, but, but now the new technology allows for a new level of participation. In other words, I can function and participate outside true reality. And this is where it begins to beg the question for the believer. At what line, at what point, do I alleviate responsibilities for my thoughts and my intents? At what point are those no longer real? At, at what point? Now, now listen, so often as, as, as believers and in our flesh, we get caught up in not committing the act. And therefore, the technology, coupled with the mythology, uh, gives me the opportunity to participate without ever really committing the act. But what did Jesus say about those in adultery? Jesus said, if you thought it, and it's been here, it's happened. It's happening. In other words, Jesus was concerned with the thoughts and the tents. And so, friends, let me ask you this. At what point is that line drawn? At what point have we left reality and we've gone into a, a different reality? And at what point do, are we no longer responsible or have to have, are there, are there no longer their consequences for our actions or more importantly, for our intent, our intent and our heart? The psalmist said this. Psalm 36 and verse 1, the transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. What was Eve's allure? What was the alternate reality presented to her? A world without God. A world where she didn't have to answer to him. And friends, let me tell you, we are quickly... As a society, now listen, let me take this outside the, the context of the church and believers, but let me just say society at large. We have quickly allowed the mythology and now the technology to combine that there are whole realms of reality where people have lost all sense of responsibility. What you would never think to do or say in the real world, you will do in the virtual world. The problem is, as technology continues to grow and increase, the desire of technologists today is to make the virtual world and the real world inconceivably, not to be, the, the, the difference not to be perceivable any longer. Let me, let me just give you a practical example. And you say, I'll just step on everyone's toes since I probably got a bunch of people so far in this. Some of you will say on Facebook what well, you would never say in public. You would never come up to this pulpit, stand in front of here, with everyone here standing here listening and quiet, just like it is now. And stand right here and say what you say. You would never do it. You would be embarrassed. You would blush. You would walk, you would leave here crying. If, 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 if we had the ability to say, listen, you come up here and say what you read, what you wrote this week. You leave. But because of the perception of a different reality that does not necessarily have the same social confines of what the, op the reality that we operate in here today, you said it. Or whatever, by ignorance, you had the idea that it really, you didn't understand the context of the terms that you were saying. But does that have real world consequences? Sure it does. Because some of you have cried real tears over things that you have read in fake Facebook. 
It's coming together. There's the melding of this, and we have to understand this as Bible believers. The mythology plus the technology is becoming the proverbial box in our minds in which God does not reign. Think about it. It's the one area that God can't touch. Because we've convinced ourselves that it really not, it's really not real. But the desire is for it to be real. And for the experience to be real. Turn with me. We'll finish here. Genesis chapter 6. How will this affect society and culture at large? Let me keep, the, let me keep it broad here. Because the majority of society is participating in this without the benefit of a biblical worldview or Bible instruction. We have to admit with that. Regardless, and we're not answering the question right now, should or should not Christians participate in this? Let's just come to this agreement. That the majority of people that are participating and fueling this do not have a biblical worldview. And so, the, if there is no Holy Spirit, there is no Bible, there is no preaching, there is no teaching that's at least putting some kind of restraint on it, that's at least giving you a weekly reality check of, hey, it's not real. It's not real. Come back. That's a grace of God in your life. Listen, if you're here today and you've heard this whole message so far and you're saying in your mind, Pastor Jason, that doesn't really apply to me. You're blowing, you're blowing too much smoke into this. I can watch any of those things and I can de clearly delineate in my mind between what is a, a, a non-biblical worldview and a, and a biblical worldview and I can separate those two things. Then friends, let me tell you this. That is nothing but the grace of God in your life and you ought to be thankful for that, but that does not give us license, nor do we have to have the same expectation that everyone, including our children, have that same maturity. So the majority of society and culture today, we all, regardless of where you might stand and how you feel so far in this whole message, we have to all agree does not have that benefit as they are participating. What began in Genesis chapter 3 with Adam and Eve and Eve, and the Satan subtly presenting her an alternate reality, she bit, comes to its culmination three chapters later. Genesis chapter 6. Look here. Genesis chapter 6, Verse 1, it came to pass that men began to multiply in the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto men. Look down at verse 5. God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. What was his wickedness? And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. What was God's displeasure? Only in their actions? Or in what they were thinking up. Now listen, this is a verse that has the context of society as a whole, all right? So let's, we'll keep it broad for a second here. Society as a whole. God's displeasure was what they were thinking up. Not what they were doing, although he was displeased in what they were doing, but it was what they were thinking. Now listen, the, the problem today, and, and maybe the, the difference between that society and today's society, is that we are being conditioned to tell everyone in the world exactly what we're thinking. And it's a scary thought. It's a scary picture that I know what you're thinking. But we're being conditioned to that. I, I thought what Pastor said to you today, it's, it's been making me think for a couple weeks now. But even thinking the Facebook revolution... We would never give up our secrets if they came to our door with a gun and said, tell me everything. I'm, not, I'm, I'm standing for my rights. I'm an American. I'm not going to tell you anything. I'm going to shoot you. All right. We're going to create an environment where you're conditioned just to tell us everything. All right. I'll do that. No problem. Can I do it for my phone? We're being conditioned. 
We're being trained. It's not about just the special effects and blowing a spaceship up. There is a worldview. There is a philosophy. And they are, we are sheep. And they put, they know, go a little this way now. Go a little this way now. And we're just being conditioned. And listen, Christian, wake up. Wake up. It's being told to us. Notice what he says here. He says, and he saw the wickedness of the man that was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And notice here, verse 6, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creepy thing and the fowls of the, earth, of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made him. What happened? God destroyed it all. Now listen, what did God destroy? Because who made it on the ark? Noah and his family. And what, did, what else did God preserve on the ark? Animals, right? So what was it that God was destroying? He didn't, wait, he didn't wipe man off the face of the earth. He saved him. Redemption was still to draw nigh, and now it was going to come through the seed of Noah. Man, God was going to redeem it. What did God destroy? He destroyed society and culture. He wiped the slate clean. Whatever it is that this pre-Diluvian, pre-flood society had conjured up, whatever it is, and some speculate that it was a very technologically advanced society, that whatever they conjured up, what God did in the ark was he erased it. He wiped it clean. He got rid of all those imaginations. Ah, oh, friends, we need to wake up to this. Same old issues. Same mythology, those things. Heroes. Same issues. Coupled with our new technology allows for a new level of participation. Your young people can play video games in which they commit horrendous, horrendous. CNN, if anyone did this in real life, would, these are the, the cycles that they, they, they spend a week talking about. And yet your young people can do them for points. And be completely immersed. Turn with me to John chapter 7, verse 24, and we'll be done. And I apologize if I said that about Genesis 6, but this one really is. All right, so let me tell you this as you're turning there. The big picture, it doesn't look good for society and culture. We're heading down the same path. We're heading down the same path. We accepted, we desired an alternate reality. The alternate reality was a reality without God. As that fermented and, and went on, it led to the destruction of all civilization and society and civilization. I hate to be the bearer of bad news. The Bible exonerates the message here. It's going to happen again. So what we see around us is not, shouldn't be a surprise. We're, we're playing the same old tune. We're playing the same record. So for society and culture at large, what is its ultimate? Is it going to be um, revived or necessarily um, saved? No, probably not. It's going to be destroyed. It's going to be destroyed. But how about for the Bible advocate? What should our response be? My devotions a couple weeks ago, I came across this verse and thought it was profound. Jesus being questioned about healing on the Sabbath day and he talks about that, and they were trying to throw a loophole at him. Much like perhaps a lot of the loopholes of justification that we throw in our own minds. Of why it's all right to do or not to do. Notice what Jesus' last words were as he talked about that in John, uh, John chapter 7, verse 24. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. You know, friends, in my life personally, that is, a, that is a stronger and more convicting statement than for me to tell you what you should and shouldn't watch. 
the meat to sit here and come up with a checklist. This is good. This is bad. This is good. This is bad. Watch this. Don't watch this. After five, you know, whatever the rules might be. But would you take those words of Christ to heart? Honestly and sincerely? And allow those to ruminate and to have effect in your life. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Righteous judgment. Fantasy worlds and technology, the avatar effect. Friends, my proposition to you this morning is the culmination of these two things is about to have greater profound effects upon our society and culture. And the Bible advocate must be prepared, must be prepared to give an answer.